talking about blood pressure and the root underlying causes, physiological reasons why your blood pressure may be high. Evan, how are we doing, man? What's cooking? Doing good. And, you know, I just found something fun that we could add to the notes here, which is about adaptogens. Because I thought, you know, you and I have been taking some form of adaptogens for probably like a combined 20 plus years at this point now. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out Panex ginseng has massive benefits as an anti-hypertensive and a vasorelaxant. So, mm. so that's cool that there are adaptogenic herbs that can help you maybe through several mechanisms. I'm sure there's a, a cortisol mechanism. I'm sure there's a uh, vasorelaxant mechanism they're talking about here, maybe like a nitric oxide impact. But this is interesting. The only time I've really struggled with blood pressure personally was when I first got exposed to mold and then I got those three tick bites in one summer. Um, I believe what was happening for me though, it was more of like a histamine mass activation problem that was driving my blood pressure. I mean, I was up into the 150 over a hundred, which is not good. Um, maybe it's worth us pulling up a chart of the different blood pressure levels. What do you think? Like the stage yeah. one hypertension, the stage two hypertension. You want to pull something like that up. That yeah, way people can good. see where they're at. And the brand Omron, O-M-R-O-N, they're pretty good. They're pretty cost effective. I know you and I both keep uh, blood pressure cuffs on hand. I think it's a great thing. If, it, if it's like an arm one, I think it seems to be a little more accurate than a wrist one. I think it's a good investment. You're looking at maybe 50 bucks or less for a decent one. I think it's worth having at home because there are times in the past where if I didn't feel my best, I would run the blood pressure and I would look and I'd see, oh, I'm, I'm running, you know, 20, 30 points lower or, oh, I'm running 20, 30 points higher. And if you're in tune enough with your body, you can feel and perceive those different levels of either hypo tension or hypertension being too high. And some of it is stress related, but I think a lot of it is, it's for me, at least it seems to be toxins and infections are driving this up too. 100%. Totally. So if we look at kind of your normal blood pressure, we have our 120 over 80. So let's kind of talk about that. So your systolic, that is when your heart is pumping. So your heart's squeezing down, right? Um, typically, that's going to be you have lub dub. So you're going to have your atria contract, and then you're going to have your ventricles contract on the, the bottom side. So top part's your atria, bottom part is your ventricles. Uh, one second, I got a dog barking here. Go for it. All right. While he's, while he's riffing on that, the hypotension is what I see a lot of people that have Lyme and co-infections. So people that have like Bartonella, Babesia, Lyme, these people tend to run low. So if you're one of those people, you're like, Hey, look, I'm here for the blood pressure podcast, but I'm never high. I'm always low. You know, it, it could be, it could be Borrelia. I mean, I've seen it so many times where women are reporting that they're somewhere in the 90 over 60 range, which that's a problem 100%. as well. 100%. So when we look at it, just you have your, your atrials, your atrium, top part, top chamber of your heart, and then your ventricles, the bottom chamber, okay? And so kind of physiology 101 for your heart, you have essentially deoxygenated blood coming back to your right atria, right? That goes to your ventricle, that gets pumped, that goes to your lungs, it grabs oxygenated blood, that goes back to your left ventricle. And then goes to your sorry left atria, and then back to your left ventricle, and then goes to systemic circulation, so your body gets oxygen. And so when we look at your systolic, that's your heart squeezing down, and then when it opens and relaxes, that's your diastolic. So some would say your diastolic is more important because that kind of gives you an idea of where your blood pressure is when you are relaxing. So when you're relaxing, that tells you that bottom number, that eighty number, and then that that top number, that one twenty or so or less that's going to be when your heart's squeezing. And so having lower blood pressure is important. Why does that matter? Because that means your heart has to squeeze less hard. So if your blood pressure is 130 or 140 on the top number, your heart has to squeeze at least that amount to get the blood moving. If not, it doesn't move. And so that means your heart has to work 20 or 30% harder. And then when you're relaxed, that diastolic number tells you where you are at when you are totally relaxed. That just puts more stress, more pressure on the vasculature, you know, and then it's a sign of inflammation a lot of times because as that vessel gets more narrow, the pressure also goes up. Think about you using an open hose to kind of water your garden, right? Put your thumb over it, the pressure increases, right? And so this is what's happening in the vasculature. A lot of times you have that vasculature narrowing or you have contraction of that vasculature. And that's usually a side of inflammation. Now, so for guys listening, 
that, that could be a sign of ED happening. ED, right? That lack of blood flow to the penis area, genitalia area can be a sign that you start to have blood pressure problems. That could be your first sign. Um, again, so you got to look at things holistically. And so if your blood pressure is chronically high, what is happening in the vasculature that's causing that level of constriction? Or am I so stressed where I'm dumping out lots of cortisol and lots of adrenaline that's causing my heart rate to go up and causing that blood pressure to go up? Because part of the stress response is higher blood pressure and the heart beating more because of the cortisol and the adrenaline response. So if we're in that stressed out response for too long, that could also be a sign too. Yeah, it's crazy to think too. At my age, I was above stage two there. I mean, I think right. my peak, my peak was probably maybe like one sixty over one ten. I mean, I felt it too. It was not a good feeling at all. Right. Luckily, it's calmed down. It's it's normal now. But this is a table um, of symptoms of maso activation that I pulled up. Can you pull that on screen? Yeah, let me pull that on screen here. You see it? I see the blood pressure one still. Do you see the one I shared, the mast cell one? Oh. This yeah, one. there we go. Yep. So, you know, this is a little right. this is a little geeky and maybe a little deeper than most people are going to go on blood pressure conversations. But if you look in the this is the common symptoms of maso activation. If you look at the cardiovascular here, right here, hypertension is one of them. But then also this right here, blood pressure lability, just meaning that you could have some days where you're low, some days where you're high. And I, and I felt those fluctuations, uh, palpitations. We see that a lot. Chest pain. Obviously that's pretty typical. If you go to a cardiologist, they're going to ask you about chest pain, but this could, this could be you. So if you look at this list, if you have hypersensitivity reactions, if you have blood pressure regularities, if you have um, tinnitus, you have hearing loss, you have nasal issues, you have dry eyes, difficulty focusing, you have flushing, you have itching, you have eczema, all these skin issues, you have fatigue, maybe you have POTS, maybe you have hypothermia or hyperthermia, maybe there's like weight fluctuations, you have chemical sensitivities, like this is maso activation. And I think just in the last four years since the virus and the injections have come out, I see way, way, way more complex cases. And I know you see the same, it's people that Things used to be a little more simple for us in the clinic, and now it's way more complicated. And it seems like the injections and the virus both have created a lot more mass cell issues. So I'm seeing more people complain about blood pressure even in just the last four years than before. Yeah, I mean, when your nervous system is out of whack, right, your, your dysautonomia, right? So you have your automatic nervous system, autonomic, right? And that's going to be part of what beats your heart causes you to breathe, right? Obviously, you can override breathing, you can override blood pressure, but part of that autonomic nervous system, I call it the automatic nervous system, when you're chronically stressed, you're going to have major impacts. When you're chronically stressed, chronically inflamed, there, there will be problems there. So we talk about blood pressure, right? Um, we want to be under 120 on the top and 80 or less on the bottom, right? The diastolic, and then you get 130 over 139, starts to become a little problematic. 80 to 89, and then stage two is going to be 140 or higher, 90 or higher, and then anything usually 180 or higher and 120 or higher is going to be, hey, go to the ER, go to your doctor, you can have a stroke. So that's kind of generally speaking, usually conventional medicine doesn't do anything with blood pressure meds until we get to 140 or higher on the systolic and then usually 90 or higher on the diastolic. But if we look at how conventional medicine tends to handle things, they tend to use either a water pill or some kind of a diuretic or some kind of an ACE inhibitor, or some kind of an angiotensin receptor blocker, an ARB. You know, you have your hydrochlorothiazide, you have your Lasix, your water pill, you have your, your angiotensin converting enzyme blocker, your ACE inhibitor, um, maybe even a beta blocker as well. So those are the big mechanisms of drugs that conventional medicine uses. And the problem is a lot of the nutritional deficiencies caused by those medications actually further perpetuate more blood pressure problems because they will cause nutrient deficiencies in Magnesium, for instance. Well, magnesium is a vasodilator and a relaxer. It's also a natural beta blocker that relaxes the heart. So you have to look at this holistically and say, well, do we want to micromanage a system in the body and get a result now that causes longer term perpetuation and need for that drug and further, further uh, lack of nutrients that are needed to run that physiology? Or are we wanting to just do a Band-Aid for a short period of time? Because if you look at a drug situation, you're going to have a, a long-term problem because you're going to further cause more deficiencies in the nutrients you need to run that system. You can get the result you need short-term, but you're going to cause a long-term side effect. Yeah, well said. And uh, metaprolol, I know that's passed out quite a bit too. And 
the mechanism is what it's on adrenaline is that i need to look up metaprolol mechanism yeah i mean you have your angiotensin converting enzyme um so you have angiotensin gets converted to renin and that increases blood pressure and so the angiotensin converting enzyme so it goes angiotensin to renin and it blocks that and then you have the arb is the angiotensin receptor blocker so it blocks the receptor site that angiotensin and renin would bind in and then you have the beta blocker which uh, on the heart there's a, a receptor that calcium would go into and that receptor is now blocked with a beta blocker now guess what also is a natural beta blocker is magnesium so magnesium would naturally kind of block some of those receptor sites that calcium would bind into to cause contraction and so and, and some of the nutrients that are needed for, you know, on the diuretic side would be depleted. A lower sodium, lower potassium, which are needed for your sodium, potassium punk in, pump and your normal cellular physiology, you need potassium. We don't get enough of it, right? The DRI is 4,700 milligrams a day. Most people are getting half that. If you go in chronometer and run your, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, most people are getting maybe around 2,500 milligrams or 3,000. You need 4,700 at the low point. And if you're on a diuretic, now you're peeing out your potassium, which you need. Yep. 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 That's what it said. Yeah. Metaprolol beta one receptors. That's what it's mm -hmm. blocking. Yep. Beta blocker. Yep. Wow. That's correct. Not root cause. And no. I think there's society in general, the trend has shifted to people just being in fight or flight. I mean, I don't know if you see it where you live, but here, I just feel like even in the past several years, the way people drive is even different. Like people are more aggressive. People seem more rushed. People cut people off more. Like I, I just see more aggressive driving in society. I mean, that was kind of picking up five years ago, but I think it's ramped up significantly. How much do you think the chronic stress of just like societal stress is is on people? Like how much do you think that's factoring into like a hypertensive case? Yeah, I mean, you have your um, your adrenal stress, your cortisol stress that's going to be problematic, right? That's going to cause your heart to overstimulate and to pump harder and, and faster. So you have that component, right? And um, that's going to be picked up on an adrenal test. When we see that cortisol rhythm, it'll be chronically high. And maybe we'll see a lot of vanil mandolate or homovanilate. We're burning up adrenaline and dopamine. So that's definitely a possibility. Okay. And um, we have to fix that. We can use the dapogens. We can use diet and lifestyle, hydration, nutrients like ashwagandha. We can use... Um, additional things like Hawthorne to relax the heart, magnesium. We can use um, beetroot powder, things that improve nitric oxide. We can do arginine. You know, beetroot powder is going to be an excellent thing as well because that's going to increase that endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which causes the blood vessels to open up. Again, many people are consuming lots of gluten and lots of high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is inflammatory, creates insulin resistance. High levels of insulin cause more sodium retention. So you're retaining your sodium higher and that's increasing the blood pressure. So there's that component. And also you're knocking out your endothelial synthase, which is your vasodilator with the high levels of fructose. So you have fructose issues. You have your, um, you have your lack of nutrients. Gluten in itself will, will increase or decrease blood flow. Lots of studies looking at the carotid arteries with gluten issues and migraines and that there's a decrease in blood flow and perfusion up the carotid to the brain. So we have decrease in blood flow. We have endothelial nitric oxide synthase. We have high levels of insulin causing more sodium retention, right? We want to have good seesaw, but if we have extra retention of it, we're not moving it through our body, back out our kidneys. Now we hold on to it and water follows sodium that increases our blood pressure too, right? So you see how that works? It's, yeah. Um, it can, it can hit on both sides of the fence. And I, and I want to say it back to people too, just because if someone's driving and they're distracted while they're listening to this, or maybe like they're laying in their bed right now, half asleep, trying to listen to this podcast to put them to sleep. Hopefully we're not that boring. So what he's telling you is the gluten, the sugar, the inflammatory foods driving up insulin is creating more water slash sodium retention, which is in driving up. So it's not the salt. That's the problem, right? Cause the conventional doctors are going to say, you got to cut the salt. You'll see these, this whole section in the spices aisle at the grocery store, salt free seasoning. And you're saying here, salt is not the problem. The context of insulin resistance, processed gluten, grains, sugar, driving up insulin. That's the problem with the sodium retention. Correct. So salt is correct. not the bad guy. It's just, yeah. So when you see all these things, also, if you get a good quality salt, right, you're going to get, a lot of other trace minerals. If you're getting a good Celtic or Himalayan or a Redmond's real salt, you're going to get a lot of other trace minerals that are important. Your nervous system needs 
sodium and chloride and all these good electrolytes, potassium, magnesium for your nervous system to function, to carry action potentials. You need these electrolytes. And so lowering them, you know, you're, you may have, you know, if you go too low, you're going to have, you know, that orthostatic hypotension where you bend over, you stand up, you get dizzy. Your nerves and elect your muscles aren't going to contract as well, right? Your adrenals are going to be depleted because your adrenals make aldosterone. It's the same part of the cortex where you make cortisol. So if you're chronically stressed and inflamed, your aldosterone is probably lower. You're, it's probably harder for you to hold on to your electrolytes. Now you add a diuretic. Now you're peeing out potassium, peeing out magnesium, and now your cells just aren't going to function well. That sodium potassium pump is really important for your cells to be able to communicate and have good, healthy cell membranes. And so you can see when your conventional MD is like, oh, well, yeah, you need to you know, cut out the salt. It's like, but is it really, should I get the insulin resistance better so the salt isn't a problem? Or should I leave the insulin alone and just manipulate the salt, right? So you always want to get to the root cause, right? If someone's like, hey, I don't want to make a diet and lifestyle change. I want to keep on being inflamed and eating crappy. Maybe that makes sense. But I think people should have informed consent and say, hey, if we do this, you can actually have this quality salt. And the actual root cause is this high level of insulin. Let's get to the root cause, right? It's amazing. It's amazing to think drinking a Coke could be your blood pressure problem. Like my grandpa, I mean, I suffered for 20 years trying to get that guy off Coke, but instead he just takes his blood pressure drug, his little magic pill, and it just keeps going on. Now, long-term impact. There's tons of sodium in Coke, by the way. Tons. Oh, is there really? We have to look that up. I mean, if you look at it, if you look at uh, Coke ingredients, there's definitely, because if part of the, re people don't know it, right? There's a ton, maybe the phosphoric acid I'm thinking of. So they're saying 45 milligrams. Now there's something else in there. I think it's maybe the phosphorus in there that's really high. There's one thing that's really high and they have to use a bunch of sugar to cover it up. And I'm pretty sure it's the sodium and then that also makes you more thirsty. So then you consume more of that drink later to cover up the thirst because there's a ton of that sodium there that makes it so your, your thirst really never gets fully quenched, right? No, it definitely doesn't quench your thirst. No. It's amazing, though, to think of the people that are waiting in line. Like here, I drove past a, a donut shop the other day, and this was on a weekend day. And there was like a line wrapped around the building for these donuts. And all the people standing in line are overweight. Some of those are clearly obese people. And some of them are standing in line with giant, like, polar pop, you know, those big styrofoam cups that are filled with like 48 ounces of whatever, high fructose corn syrup, you name it. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's I don't know why people don't care about this. I mean, long-term impact, obviously, stroke is possible, heart attack is possible. But for me personally, just feeling high blood pressure, it drives anxiety too. And right. one of the papers that I was looking at, uh, one of my favorite herbs is, is motherwort. And yes. so there was a paper here that was effect of Leonis cardiaca. So that that's the Latin, Leonuris maybe. Uh, motherwort is is the name of it though, but motherwort is one of my favorite herbs because of its um, anti anxiety effects. It's kind of like a mild sedative, but then if you take higher dose, it can help you with insomnia. So, long story short, they did they did a study on fifty patients. They were treated for twenty eight days using twelve hundred milligrams of a motherwort extract, and there was a significant improvement in not only blood pressure but anxiety and mm. depression as well. So that's really cool that you could use a plant instead of a beta blocker. We're using a plant extract, which not only is helping you sleep better, it's reducing your anxiety, reducing your depression, and reducing your blood pressure. Also wow. for heart palpitations, motherwort is one of my favorite. So if you're listening, if you have that issue, obviously – Let's get some labs on you. Let's figure out what we're doing. Let's not just throw mother war and just move on. We still need to figure out root cause here. Is it heavy metals driving it or what the hell's happening? Let's help you figure it out. But in the meantime, it's been one of my favorite. Like if I had to go to a desert island, I could only take a few things. That's certainly one of them. Yeah, hundred percent. So, I mean, we look at the root cause. We got to get to the root cause. We talked about some of the nutrients that with Coke, it's the phosphoric acid that I'm thinking of, um, you know, Phosphoric acid is going to throw off your sodium as well, going to create lots of craving issues. Then you consume more fructose, and um, the fructose then causes more of the blood pressure problems, decreases that endothelial synthase, um, which is really important for vasodilation. So again, what are the big nutrients? So also vitamin D plays a very important role in modulating renin, right? So you go angiotensin, angiotensin to renin. Renin causes more fluid retention. Vitamin D modulates renin, similar as an ACE inhibitor, but it's not going to 
be have drug like effects plus vitamin D has a lot of other immune benefits. It does help with calcium and phosphorus absorption, helps with your immune system, modulating your T regulatory cells, especially if you have autoimmune issues. Very important. So vitamin D, very important. Potassium, magnesium, important for your cells to work, important to relax your heart. Again, hydrochlorothiazide, water pills, Lasix are going to decrease and deplete a lot of those nutrients. We already talked about, you know, arginine can be good. Um, your beetroot powder are going to be excellent. Great ways to increase vasodilation. Getting your insulin in check, getting your insulin below seven is very important, at least below 10, to keep the sodium retention down. Is sodium a problem? Only if your insulin's really high is it a problem. Now, should you decrease sodium? Maybe if you're like, well, I don't want to have my insulin. If I, I'm, I'm open to keep my insulin high and eating crap, then maybe there's an argument to keep that down. But I think you get to the root cause, which is the high insulin, plus that causes all kinds of vascular inflammation issues. It causes the advanced glycation end products. That causes lots of oxidative stress in the vasculature, especially the small vessels like the eyes. And you're more likely to lay down lots of foam cells and, and have blockages. So that's a, a problem there too. And then we can add in things like Hawthorne, um, Benito, peptide. This is an amino acid kind of peptide that's been shown to be very helpful as well. I mentioned yeah. Hawthorne as well. Anything else you want to highlight? Magnesium is good. Grape seed extract is really good from actual grapes. A lot of the resveratrol compounds in there. Very helpful for vascular health. Anything else you want to highlight nutritionally? Man, well, I almost put herbs into the nutrition category, but I guess it's more supplemental. You know, the interesting thing on the paper about ginseng was that it can have an anti-hypertensive effect, but then it says here, paradoxically, it also could be known to increase blood pressure. And so that's the cool thing about adaptogens and why you and I use them so much clinically is because if someone's coming in too low or too high, the adaptogens can help you to regulate your body. So rather than just saying, hey, I'm hypertensive, my blood pressure is high, here's a drug that's going to do nothing but lower you. And by the way, it can make you completely exhausted. I've had several people who were above 60, they were put on beta blockers. Now you don't really have that same adrenaline response when you go to play sports. So some of these people I was working with in their 60s, they had to stop playing tennis or they had to significantly reduce their physical output because you can't respond to that running. You can't respond. It's almost like right. you have yep um you know like the if you ever been to like a golf cart uh place or, or or like a go-kart track where they have a governor on the engine that's yes. basically the way i perceive beta blockers affecting the yep. physical output these people just literally like on a scale of one to ten their energy output is now limited to like a six they can't do that same umph when they're on these medications 100 percent Totally. Now we can also add in pomegranate or olive leaf or cranberry extract. These are all really good things. I mentioned Hawthorne earlier. Olive leaf we use in a lot of our gut killing products, but it's shown to be very helpful too. Um, we can even, I mentioned the grapeseed extract, we talked about magnesium, whether it's a malate or a glycinate, very good as well. You can even do a magnesium sulfate, Epsom salt, foot bath, uh, very good. Garlic is amazing as well. You can also throw in dandelion, which is good for gallbladder and digestion. Passion flower is very good as well. If your heart's under stress, it's going to require more CoQ10. It's going to require more carnitine for fatty acid burning. And so if your heart is under stress, make sure you increase that CoQ10. Have good carnitine there as well. Make sure your B vitamins are dialed in. Again, the more carbohydrate and the more elevated your insulin is, you're going to burn through your B vitamins. You're going to burn through your magnesium. You're going to burn through your CoQ10 because it's an expensive transaction to process lots of fructose, lots of sugar. Just to give you a, for instance, in one 12 ounce thing of Coke, you get 10 teaspoons of sugar, 10 teaspoons. Now your body, guess how much in your six liters of your blood, if you're a hundred MGs per DL, right? That's like your typical, like you want to be under that just slightly for your blood, right? For your blood sugar, hundred MGs per DL. Guess how much sugar that is in your entire six liters of blood? It's not much. I remember you told me this before. It's one teaspoon. So when you literally consume a Coke, 12 ounces, that's 10 teaspoons of sugar, your body's freaking the heck out. Where do I do, what do I put nine to 10 teaspoons of sugar? Where do I put it? If it's fructose, it preferentially goes to the liver over the muscles. If it's glucose, it goes to the muscle over the liver. Once those sites are all stored full of glycogen, right? Right, liver's full of glycogen. It starts to get converted to palmitic acid and fatty acid and stored as fat starts to become a non-alcoholic fatty liver, and then it goes to fat on your body. And so 
So this is why you want to make sure you mitigate your, the sugar because your body is like, what do I do with this? And most people don't realize how much sugar is already in your blood. And if you have, let's say, a half a teaspoon, right, because one teaspoon is normal, a half a teaspoon, you're in a coma, right? So that's your, – your blood sugar is so tightly regulated by your body. And so it will, your body will freak out and send that to the muscles and the liver. You'll have a non-alcoholic fatty liver. You'll start gaining weight. You'll get insulin resistant because the more fatty your liver gets, the more insulin you need for those cells to open up. So you become insulin resistant. The cell becomes numb. You start seeing your fasting insulin go above 10, 11, 12 into the 20s. And that starts to set a table for lots of inflammation. And when you have inflammation in your body, it's an impact the brain. So mood issues, energy issues, depression, brain fog. And then more than likely, a lot of the foods that you're eating to increase that blood sugar have lots of processed grains and flours. And then you have a whole gluten sensitivity, leaky gut thing going on there next. Yeah. And what you're saying to the average person on the street corner, that may sound extreme. Like, listen to this crazy guy talking about nutrition. Oh my God, sugar's the devil. You know, that's how the average person may perceive it. But all you got to do is take a walk in the woods anywhere on this planet, and you're going to realize how rare that level of processed sugar and or processed grain mm -hmm. is like right now, if I were to go, I've got thousands of acres of state forest around here. If I go hiking right now, I'm going to find literally like zero, 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 zero sugar. Possibly I've seen a few wild strawberries growing. They're tiny. They're like the size of my pinky fingernail. I've seen some blackberries. They're not ready yet, but I've seen the flowers. So there will be blackberries soon. So let's just say the blackberries are in full harvest. I'm like a black bear. I come across this big old patch of berries and I just gorge myself on those blackberries. They're gone. That's it. Once I've had right. those, it's it's gone. And then maybe, maybe, maybe if I'm crazy enough and I find a beehive and I'm going to somehow like a crazy person get the honey out of there, I'm right. going to binge on that and then that's gone. So you know what you're describing to some people – if they haven't been in the nutrition world, the functional medicine world, it, it may sound so extreme. Like, oh my God, this guy's just demonizing Coke. Coke is the devil. Like, that's my takeaway from this podcast. Just look at nature. It's rare to come across that amount. And, and that's not even a fair comparison because, you know, the blackberries that I go find in the bush there still doesn't compare to the spike you're going to get from an actual soda, an actual Coke. I'm going to pull up this article here by Stefan Guillenet. He did a blog post where he looked at, USDA f sugar in intake over the last 100, 150 years. I've actually put this article in my book, in my thyroid book coming out. Hey, that was while, really, really good. While you're getting that, will you pull up this oat test on screen real quick? I just want to show people nutritional markers that we're measuring because you referenced a few things. I just want to show people the graphic here. Yes. So – one of the tests we run on pretty much everyone clinically is an organic acids test. This is an at-home fasted urine sample. You wake up, pee in the cup, you get it back to the lab. And we've covered a lot of aspects of this. The neurotransmitters, how those are measured on there is incredible. The bacterial and fungal issues that we measure is incredible. But what you're looking at here, if you're watching the video, if you're just listening on audio, we're just seeing the different bars here. And what we're, what we're seeing in this particular client is a lot of low nutrient levels. And this is extremely common. So you were talking earlier about the depletion of CoQ10, for example. You can see here this person was pretty low in CoQ10. We see biotins on the low side, vitamin C's low all the time, B5 low, B6 low. So this is your average person on paper, even if they're eating grass-fed meats, even if they're on an organic diet. There's a lot of factors and reasons behind this, infections and different stressors, but the average person is nutrient deficient even if they're eating a very clean diet. So don't think you can eat your way out of this. There's some cases where you need actual supplements and nutrients to fix this. Yeah, 100%. I totally agree. Now, here's an interesting article here that I have from Stefan Guillenet. It came out about 10 years ago, but the sentiment's still the same. They looked at U.S. sugar consumption. They used USDA reporting based on production, not consumption, and they used – based on how much loss there was on average, and they were able to figure out production and loss averages, and then come up with US sugar consumption by decade. So you can see 1820, we were around four pounds per year, and now we're over 100 pounds per year, 2010, 2020. So you can see four pounds to 100 pounds plus. And here's the deal, people like me and you aren't eating a lot, so someone's eating two or 300 pounds to make up for us, right? Isn't that crazy? And so it used to be, sugar used to be a rich man's food. 
right? It used to be like, oh, if you were rich, you know, in the 1800s, like you had the extra honey, you had that extra brown sugar, right? Extra molasses. And now it's the opposite. It's the people that, you know, are more wealthy are staying away from the sugar and the people that, you know, aren't as, you know, wealthy, they're eating more processed sugar, they're eating more processed food. So there's been this total switch. And I think a lot of this is due to government sponsored agriculture, sponsoring the soy, sponsoring the, the corn, sponsoring all the sources to make sugar artificially cheap. I think there was a book by Michelle Simon. She was a attorney over in the Bay Area, but she looked, it's called Appetite for Profit. And she basically looked at the fact that all the junk food that we have out there, right, we perceive it as being so cheap, it's artificially cheap due to government subsidies. Yeah. And that, imagine if like you actually, you know, if we took away government subsidies of these cheap foods, it'd be so much more expensive. It'd be harder to eat a lot of these junky foods. This is why you don't see someone who's homeless or impoverished, super malnourished and skinny, right? Or people on the people that are homeless today are the, you know, a lot of times are overweight. They're, they're calorie nourished. This is a, a total opposite from the 1940s. For instance, if you go look at the 1940s, people that were being recruited into the army, we had a major problem of our 17, 18 and 20 year olds being totally malnourished that they couldn't even be drafted. Remember stories of my grandfather in 1940, 42, he was drafted to go to World War II and he was six foot one, six foot two, 120 pounds, all right? The people back then were incredibly malnourished and now we have the exact opposite thing, but the calories are coming from a lot of processed crap food. And so we see this kind of challenge happening and why it's because of, you know, a lot of subsidies artificially making this food cheap. So you have an intention over here, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. All right, let's make food cheaper, but then you get more of the wrong food that creates more inflammation, and here we are. Now we have this major obesity, cardiovascular, cancer, you know, you name it, epidemic, autoimmune disease epidemic. Oh, yeah. I mean, you could overlay that graph you just showed with hypertension. You yep. could overlay 100%. that with cancer, cancer anything. And it would, it would, it's all yeah. there. And, and yeah. then other people are going to say, oh, but, you know, it's seed oils. Oh, it's, it's, it's glycosate. That's a part of it. It's this. That's part of it. I mean, I, I would argue that a lot of the seed oils are also follow that government subsidy kind of track, right? You're, we're artificially creating these foods. We're making them cheaper. Um, yeah, I mean, getting tallow and getting ghee and getting like good coconut, it's a lot more expensive to get those foods than to get government subsidized seed oils that you can, you know, have a longer shelf life, right? A lot of it started from like the, tr the hydrogenated fats. We could take vegetable oils, we could make them solid at room temperature and then have a longer shelf life because they're already oxidized. And so a lot of it was like, how can we take fats and give them a longer shelf life? And a lot of the processing of coconut oil and, you know, animal fats, they're just a lot more, you know, it's going to be a lot more labor intensive. These good quality meats though are becoming more readily available. Even mm -hmm. at Walmart, you can get grass fed ground bison yep. for it's in fair. the ballpark of it's seven, eight dollars a pound. You can get, I've seen, uh, well, grass, with your money. I've seen a hundred percent organic grass fed burgers. You're talking about $2 a burger at Walmart. They're either a third or a quarter pound. I forget they come in this pack a hundred percent grass fed, grass finished organic burgers for less than any drive through in America. Yeah. So, it takes a couple of minutes, get your stainless steel pan, put it on high, throw your butter, your ghee, your tallow, whatever on there, boom, salt it, flip it, boom, done, and you're in for a few bucks. Your chicken thighs too. Chicken thighs are really good skin on. You can still get at least some, some decent free-range pasture-raised eggs under five bucks for a dozen. I mean, you do the math. If, if you need four eggs for a meal, that's a buck fifty for your protein for a meal. That's still pretty good. Yeah. That's still pretty cheap. You know, if you can eat – you can have a decent meal for under four to five bucks a meal. You know, I remember being in the Bay Area in, in the mid 2000s and, you know, living on $14,000 a year, $15,000 a year financial aid. And I still ate organic every week. I just had to be careful. Chicken thighs, ground beef. I couldn't do filet. I couldn't do ribeyes. And I, you know, I would kind of supplement with some organic frozen vegetables here and there and just try to choose what was more in season, right? Because those would tend to be a little bit cheaper. And we had a farm co-op that we went to as well where we got a bag full of, you know, organic vegetables for 30 bucks a week, huge bag. And so there's ways you can do it. There's ways you can mitigate if you can't use the clean 15 over the dirty dozen, right? So there's ways you can mitigate. And it's good, better, best. If you can't go all the way, well, there's there's a, a better version. There's still a, a good version. So, you know, essentially good is the enemy of great. So don't allow being good something that prevents you from even trying at all, right? Yeah. You know, an A is better than a B, but a B is better than a C. So just do the best you can with what you got.
Yep. Amen. All right. Well, let's wrap this thing up. So we covered some of the root causes here, insulin messing up your sodium retention. We covered some of the adaptogenic herbs you could potentially use, motherwort, your ginsengs, uh, obviously getting magnesium. some functional testing done. Yeah. Magnesium, potassium. Epsom salt, foot bath if you need. Oh, also cold exposure, cold plunges. Excellent. Huge parasympathetic support, huge parasympathetic tone from that cold shock protein. So that's wonderful as well. And on the heat side, infrared sauna. Yeah. Very helpful on that side as well. Plus, you're getting toxins out. So if you have any mold issues or metals that are causing blood pressure issues, which they can, it's at least a gentle, natural way of sweating and then you know get a shower afterwards so you get the toxins out and you don't reabsorb it. So cold and hot are nice, easy, simple modalities that you can play into the mix too. Yeah, tests don't guess. So get, let's get some oat testing done so we can look at your nutrient levels. There's other testing we could do for nutrients as well. Obviously, the gut infections play a role too. We'll look at the gut, see how your nutrient absorption is. How is your fat digestion? How is your gut inflammation? Are you not even absorbing exactly. all these things? You can taking? go deeper. We can go yes. deep in this. Good nasal breathing, four seconds into the nose, get the parasympathetic fibers going. All really good things. You could throw sleep in there, but you know, we're just trying to keep it simple. You know, what are some of the diet lifestyle things? What are some of the supplement things? I think we have some good reviews, some good ideas so far. We'll put some links down below. And if you guys want to reach out to Evan, evanbrand.com. Evan is available, you know, worldwide for patients, telemedicine wise. I am as well, Dr. J at justinhealth.com. If you guys want support, people that have been in the trenches 10 plus years, um, we are where it's at. So we appreciate you guys listening. Put your comments down below. Love to see what you're thinking, what you're saying, and future ideas for topics. Anything else, Evan? Yeah, I'll just give the links one more time. Folks listening, if you need Dr. J, that's just in health, justinhealth.com. You can reach out. We'll help you to facilitate labs. We'll get these shipped to you. If we need blood, we could do blood. It's pretty easy. And you get the results. Go on a call, make a protocol, get better. Uh, myself, evanbrand.com is the website, and we're happy to help you all. Excellent. Well, appreciate it, guys. Evan, excellent chatting with you, man. Talk to you soon.